Okay, uh, so my name is Adrian Jackson. I'm a researcher at uh, EPCC at the University of Edinburgh. Um, as you can see, I'm in my 1970s uh, Swedish sauna whilst I give this presentation. It's a shame he doesn't let me do virtual backgrounds here so I could block out some of my room. Um, but uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today, or what I'm going to talk about today, is uh, using node local storage uh, for IO and for other operations in applications. Uh, and of course, this is not um, something new. People have been thinking about this for uh, uh, quite a long time. If you go back through the papers and through the the archives is sort of, you know, a lot of people talking about this 10 years ago, even longer than that, using node local storage. Uh, and also I've talked about this and, and colleagues of mine have talked about this before at similar workshops. You know, we had quite a, a long, uh, uh, an interesting project, European funded project called Next Gen IO, which finished probably now two years ago, uh, looking at exactly this kind of thing. But we've been continuing this, this research and um, con continuing this exploration. Uh, to see what the benefits are and whether we can, from an architectural point of view, do something uh, interesting with, with uh, node local storage. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Actually, ideally, what I'd be doing here is presenting a, a whole new data storage system or a whole new file system, um, explo exploiting node local storage. But of course, that takes a long time and we're early days in, in that development. So here I'm just think, talking about some of our initials of background ideas of why we're pursuing a uh, node local storage. And again, this is not something that is revolutionary or new to us. There's plenty of other people doing this. You can look at things like the, the Unify FS um, uh, from the from the states and, and other kinds of things like this. People are already working on on exploiting node local storage. And at some level you could look at MADFS, which was presented yesterday um, at the IO 500 buffer. Uh, as somewhat a node local storage system as well, just as it's Gecko FS, which was the file system which was worked on as part of the next gen IO project is all, all local storage. But I have a slightly different take on it uh, uh, on why we're interested in node local storage and that's what I'm, I'm going to go through today. Um, and this, you know, I've presented this kind of data before, so I'm, I'm afraid you're probably all bored of this by now. Um, but we initially started off looking at this as a demand management performance issue, right? So the top graph is uh, multiple benchmarks of the same code doing the same thing over various times, time slots, you know, across a month. Um, and what we see on our system we were benchmarking it on, of course, this is very spe system specific. And, you know, if you talk to Glenn, his, his amazing system, I'm sure won't do this. But for the uh, file systems we had on this, um, you see variation. In not all the time, you know, 70% of a runtime is is pretty much standard um, for the I/O cost in this top graph. 70% of a runtime is down here in these in these blocks here, and and that's varying by about 2x um, across it. So from say one second up to about three seconds. But of course, um, over time, we also see much bigger outliers, uh, and so here this is. This is a same run on, the, on a similar day, but it takes you know over 10 times longer. Now, this is just the IO part of a particular code, but it was this kind of uh, demand management and conflict between jobs that we were looking to exploit uh, node local storage to to prevent or to ameliorate. Uh, you know, down here at the bottom is some some um, monitoring we do on a and actually one of our research systems, uh, but of a Lustre file system. There and again, you know, the, the, the point is that it doesn't really matter what these are, are but the point is that this we we see this bursty or intermittent demand um, over time. And so, if your job runs at the same time as someone else is doing a lot of IO and you're doing IO, you're going to see slower performance. And um, so, using node local storage, if it's possible, is one of the ways to mitigate this. And the other reason that I like node local storage in that context, of course, is that it, it lets you scale up your storage with your compute. So one of the challenges we have um, for our systems is provisioning enough uh, IO uh, performance for the size of system. You know, the, you, you buy your uh, computer on the number of compute nodes, 
and the performance it will give. And then you need to provision a, an IO system which goes alongside that. Uh, and, uh, what, and what do you provision it for? Do you provision it for peak load? Do you provision it for average load? Uh, those those kind of uh, questions are, are always interesting and there's a, you know, a real balance between what you put in the, in the hardware side there. But if you have node local storage and that's all you're using, then uh, I'll admit that comes with challenges, of course. But if you have node local storage, then your IO scales with your compute, right? So you add more compute nodes, you add more IO. And so, so conceptually, it's quite a nice, um, nice feature, right? It, 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 you lose your interference because you're the only person using the nodes that your IO is on. So you shouldn't really have very much interference other than the network in general. Um, and you also can scale your IO um, with your system size, you know, with the caveat that you probably can't afford to do this. Uh, uh, and it's complex and, and there's all these other kind of things. But, you know, right, I'm a researcher, I'm an academic, so I don't have to care about the real world. I can just ignore those problems and say, uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the thing we should be doing. And of course, this was all uh, the next gen IO project. This was all built off uh, Optane. So Intel's Optane DIMMs. So we have uh, node local storage here inside the compute nodes using these DIMMs. Now, of course, the elephant in the room with Optane is, it, is its cost. Um, so if we could all put large amounts of Optane into our nodes it, and it was cheap, then people would probably be doing it. But Optane hasn't significantly taken off. Um, I, I posit because of the cost uh, and, and potentially availability. OK, but, you know, this this is a research project we did and we were looking at the ways you exploit Optane from uh, computational simulation codes, uh, particularly. And we we know, and I've shown this many times, you'll be bored of this graph as well, most of you. We know we can get good performance out of it. So we have this prototype system. Each node has um, three terabytes of, uh, of Optane memory in it, first generation. And if we look at simple benchmarks, so IOR easy, that's a file per process. Um, and we run up to the 34 nodes we have, we can get you know really very high uh, bandwidth by uh, exploiting this node local memory. So we can get up to, uh, actually, this graph is, is using a file system. And, and, and we'll see in a minute if we do it in different ways, you can get slightly faster, but near, near two terabytes of, of read bandwidth and, and about 400, 300, 400 gigabytes of, of write bandwidth. You know, which using only 34 nodes and and our storage is the same as our compute nodes here. So we're not using 34 client nodes and 34 storage nodes. We're just using 34 nodes. That can give us uh, great performance. Now, of course, as you'll say, there's a whole bunch of usability issues around this. Uh, how does that how does that work? How do you leave your data behind? How do you access your data from multiple jobs? All those kind of things. And and absolutely, those are, are problems to be tackle but this is the kind of context that we were playing in uh, looking at performance uh, from the jobs by um, using node local storage uh, and you know one of the big out you know one of the big focuses actually of this research was that um, it was not just we don't just care about single applications we care about workflows scientific workflows and um, so uh, whilst we want to improve the IO performance of individual jobs, actually what people what end users really care about is the IO performance of their workloads in general, right? So if I'm a scientist, I don't spend most of my time just running my job. There's all sorts of things I have to do beforehand, data preparation, uh, visualization and analysis, all, all those kind of things. Uh, and we see, you know, increasingly we see multi-physics simulations, we see uh, multiple applications coupled together. So node local storage also offers this benefit that we can minimize the costs of transferring data between um, stages in a, in a computational workflow, as well as optimizing the performance for an individual application. And, you know, this was synthetic benchmarking we were doing here, but we were looking to see, can you compress down the um, workflow, uh, overall workflow runtime for a set of workflows uh, if you exploit the fact that you leave the data and move your workflows to the data, leave your data on the nodes rather than 
undertaking a, a workflow step, saving the data to external storage like a Lustre or GPFS file system, and then copying it back in at the end um, between each stage. And of, and of course, we, you can, you definitely can. I know it's complexity here and how you how you map individual workflow components to different nodes and how you make sure the data is in the right place. Um, and we did quite a lot of nice work there. And for Alberto, uh, who's on this um, call here uh, from BSC, also did some, some great work on data scheduling and um, components to move data between nodes. So there was lots of stuff, interesting stuff there. Uh, and interestingly, you know, that work has continued. So uh, recently we were working with some end users who have a particular application workflow where the workflow itself is actually embedded inside the uh, code. So the, this is uh, this slides disappoint me slightly because I had hoped to get through the whole presentation by just showing you pictures. Um, but uh, this one, I couldn't really turn it into very nice pictures. So it has to be text. So apologies for that. But um, uh, here the application is doing is a, is a CFD application using a uh, combined forward adjoint where it has a forward phase where it does a simulation and then, and then based on the data produced by that it does an adjoint phase afterwards uh, to do the overall calculation uh, and the real challenge with this approach is that um, to do the adjoint phase you need all the data from the full forward phase uh, and so this application was doing this by saving the data out after the uh, during the forward phase saving all the checkpoints uh, out to external file system and then reading it back in to do the joint phase and this approach was being taken uh, very sensibly because you could do this all in memory right you could do this all in memory uh, keep your forward data in memory and then process your joint data um, in memory as well but it requires very large amounts of uh, simulation so uh, of, of storage so if you look at our medium simulation here the DNS state requires four terabytes of storage, but it only need it can only use, due to the way the decomposition is done, 70T processes, 72 MPI processes, right? So if we need that four terabytes of data in memory, we're going to use quite a lot of nodes without necessarily exploiting the computational um, capacity of those nodes. We're just using them for memory. So. Here, this application goes to uh, right out to disk. And, and likewise, for a sort of a large or reasonable simulation, you can go up to about 512 processes, but it needs about 40 terabytes of storage. So if we, we consider our you know, average nodes has 256 gigabytes of data, we're looking at sort of 100 nodes here. 100 nodes may have a couple of thousand processes, but we're only using five, you know, even more than that. Our, our latest system, Archer 2, has got 128 cores per node. Uh, if we use 100 nodes there, that's 12,000 cores, but we're only able to use 512 of these. Now, of course, there's things you can do with MPI plus OpenMP and those kind of things. But the approach these, the, the, this group was taking was save the data out to file and don't, not require all that volatile memory uh, but, and save it back, uh, and read it back in for the, the joint phase, which is fine and worked well for them on small scales, but we're, they were finding when they were going up to the large scales, when you were needing 40 terabytes of luster um, storage on the systems they were using, it was just becoming um, a costly, very costly phase. Um, so what we did was port this instead of using, saving the data externally to a luster file system, save the data to the node local storage. And of course, this is a lovely case because uh, we don't need this data after the applications run. It really is temporary data. Each process produces its own file. Um, so there's no sharing of data. Uh, and so we can just use the node local storage uh, directly. We can just write uh, data out. Each file writes out to the, the non-volatile memory on the node. Um, and that can really um, reduce the amount of time it takes to, to run this. So if we if we looked on the, you know how we do this in our Lustre file system, for the medium case on three nodes, it would take about 10,000 seconds. For a large case on 22 nodes, it would take 80,000 seconds. Um, whereas we really, you know, so you can really see that this IO cost is ramping up. Whereas if we if we write it out to um, IO um, on the local storage, and in this case it's obtained memory, but it, you know it could as well be non uh, NVMe devices or SSDs in the nodes. Um, 
you see that the actual IO costs really sort of do go away now. So instead of taking eight, 80,000 seconds, it's now taking 9,200 seconds. So we can see we scale up uh, the simulation uh, using more nodes, but the IO cost is not dominating anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, so these kind of applications show that there can be beneficial uses for the node local storage, um, either in this case inside a single application or in the workflow cases between application steps. Um, but the, the, the thing that really occurs to um, us here is actually, uh, of course, the, the workflow stages um, and the node local storage for application stage, one of the things it's also saving you is, is energy. Um, so, you know, these are sort of the costs of, this graph here is sort of the cost of moving data around inside a single uh, Archer 2 node. Archer 2 has uh, AMD Epic to AMD Epic processors. And so we can see that, you know, moving data from our local uh, uh, cores to uh, uh, the other socket takes, you know, a fair bit of time, quite a lot uh, uh, more time than moving data um, inside my own local core groups. Um, uh, and then if we go beyond that, if we're looking going beyond moving data inside a single node to moving data outside the nodes, actually you can see that once you start moving data here, this is MPI jobs, outside a node, then of course it's costly. You know, in this example, if I can keep my data local um, and access an MPI message that way, so this is not memory accesses, it's going through the MPI library, it's about 10 times faster than if I have to go and talk to another node. So that means that we, if we can bend, if you know, if we can utilize this uh, node local storage, we're saving time, both in terms of the application, but also in terms of energy required to move that data around. Uh, but the thing that really bothered me about this work is it's all fine, it's all great, but here it's we're not really exploiting the benefits of the memory nature of the storage medium. So this is, uh, you know, getting good performance by using node local storage, but this could have been, you know, the six uh, NVMe drives that the MADFS uh, deployment has per node, right? I could have been writing these out to uh, external SSDs or non-volatile or at some level as long as it was fast enough I could have been writing this out to a spinning disk inside the node of course it's, it's unlikely it would have been fast enough but actually we're not benefiting from the fact that this is vol a non-volatile memory we're just using it as storage and that to me is a real benefit because um, when we start looking at the actual uh, memory aspect of it and access it in, in a memory way then we can actually start to see some really interesting uh, performance features. And again, I've shown these graphs before, so apologies if you've seen this before. One of the things that were interesting in, as, to us in the first instance if, is if we benchmark this non-volatile memory using uh, a file system, that's what this FSDAX is here, writing our data out to files, going through a block interface, or using it as memory, through this PMDK library, actually we see the same performance with this IOR benchmark here, right? So here it looks like it doesn't make us any dif any difference to us if we write it out as files or we write it as memory, you know, we're just using it as fast storage and it doesn't give us any performance benefits. But that's because this IOR ban uh, benchmark I'm doing here was set up to do um, one megabyte data transfer. So it was set up to write data out in chunks. When it becomes more interesting from my perspective is when we actually start looking at it, if we change that configuration, actually say, okay, this is memory, this is not storage. I don't want to do block IO. I don't want to do asynchronous stuff. I want to do small amounts of IO directly to our uh, DIMMs. And, and so this is the same benchmark on the right-hand side here, <clears throat> running exactly the same thing, but instead of writing out a megabyte at a time, I'm writing out 256 bytes. Um, so much smaller uh, data operations. And what we can see here is that these PMDK uh, libraries, where we're accessing the data as memory, uh, accessing the device as memory, not as uh, I.O., then we suddenly get two, two or three orders of magnitude better performance. Uh, and actually, that's better highlighted. And again, so a bunch of graphs I've shown to this audience before, probably. If we look at the same IOR benchmark, here we're doing read, but write similar, um, and we vary the block size we use, we can see that IOR 
um, through uh, the file system here can get the same performance as IOR through the memory interface here. And um, once we get it up to large block sizes, so once we get start getting up to, uh, you know, kill, tens of kilobytes, hundreds of kilobytes of data, then we can get the performance we expect from the hardware. But going through the memory um, interface means that we can actually get much better performance all the way down to very small I.O. operations. So here we, we can see that from 128 bytes <clears throat> all the way up to 64 kilobytes, we see you know, excellent I.O. performance um, regardless of the I.O. size. And, and so that strikes me as actually what we can do here um, is, uh, is start to look at doing I.O. in a different way. So we've spent 20, 30 years optimizing our I.O. to do bulk um, synchronous transfer or bulk asynchronous transfer in large blocks because that's what gives us good performance on the hardware that we have been using up till now. Um, and that's what the software is optimized for at some level. But uh, as we've demonstrated here, there's new memory technologies uh, gives you good performance, give you as good performance of NVMEs. Um, but to really benefit from them, you need to change how you're using them because you don't get, you know, populating uh, node um, DIMMs, uh, you know, memory DIMMs with this storage is expensive and you're not really getting the benefit from it. Whereas you could have just stuck this on a PCI Express um, uh, port uh, and used it as, as storage. Um, now, of course, again, I'm not saying anything revolutionary here. Right? Everybody knows that these DIMMs are good for, great for small random IOs. That's one of the things that they're great for. Um, but here, what I'm, uh, you know, from a HPC or computational simulation or even machine learning perspective, what's interesting to me is actually those don't have to be random IOs. They could be small contiguous IOs and we could still get great performance. So. Fundamentally, what I think is interesting here is we can actually start to re-architect how we do I.O. for applications. And instead of doing I.O. in sort of phases where we do our calculations and then we do our I.O. and then we do our calculations and we do our I.O. And that I.O. is, is large scale and, um, you know, done in such a way as to optimize for block external block devices. Can we actually start to interleave our I.O. with our compute? in such a way that we are doing small amounts of IO all the time, utilizing the fact that we can use this external, use this hardware features of this non-volatile memory, the fact that we can do byte addressability and we can do random accesses or indeed contiguous accesses um, as quickly as bulk accesses. And so what I, we've done here is taken the MAD2 IO benchmark, which has been around for a long time, but um, is one of the nice IO benchmarks because it does you can run it in such a way where it is real compute work and you can mix the compute work if you alter the benchmark as we've done with our IO work. And so what we've done is turn this into a block benchmark where we, instead of doing the IO compute phases separately, we try and mix the IO and compute phases uh, together. And so what we've done here is the this phase of the, IO, of the MAD benchmark goes for a, a two dimensional matrix. Um, and then it, it, it constructs some data and it writes it out. So originally it constructs the whole matrix and writes it out to disk. What we've done then is gone in and altered it. So it goes through the uh, benchmark and it constructs every row of this matrix and then writes every row out to disk instead. And that's what we call blocked down here. And you can see when I run it on our latest HBC system, the original benchmark on 20 nodes is taking for the IO uh, phase here, we're taking about um, uh, eight seconds, plus or minus some things. And if I do this where I'm writing out per block, per, per row, so, you know, I'm probably doing about 4,000 more writes than I am in this case, um, actually it's taking significantly longer, you know, so we're taking sort of four times longer because the IO system is not optimized for that. Um, and if I want to take that down to much finer levels of detail, instead of work, writing out each row, which is probably 4,000 elements, I want to write 32 uh, elements at a time or 16 elements or eight elements. We can see that the IO cost really ramps up, right? So here I'm doing very large numbers, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of IO operations compared to the original here, and that's expensive. You know, so you wouldn't write your application like this 
on a standard external file system using uh, block interfaces. However, if we take it onto our prototype system and instead target the on node storage, um, then uh, what we can see here actually is that uh, when we go, so this is here using the Lustre file system on our prototype, then this is right into the node local storage and we get some performance benefit doing that. And then if we go to a blocked uh, system where we're writing out in, in, in rows of data, then it slows down again on, on, on that file system on the FS DAX, which is a file system on the non-volatile memory. Uh, but if we go to a PMDK interface, a memory interface instead, then actually going to this blocked format where we're doing multiple writes per uh, benchmark rather than a single write per benchmark, we don't see any performance difference there. And actually, if we take it to the extreme, where instead of writing out uh, individual uh, rows to the file system on the node local storage with SS DAX, which is this blocked version here, we write out every eight elements. So we, we're doing you know, hundreds of thousands of writes here. We can see even using this node local storage um, on the file systems, uh, on the, sorry, on the opt-in DIMMs, which are very fast, we still have this massive overhead going to these large numbers of writes. Whereas if we go through the, the memory interface with this PMDK interface, I, mean, I, I, can, I think we are I, reaching. Yep, yeah, yeah, this is my this is literally my last. Uh, sorry, sorry. Last slide. That's okay. Um, where we go to this blocked uh, interface, um, we can see that we can write out eight elements at a time, a whole row at a time, or the whole data set in a single. Uh, fell sweep. I mean, effectively, I mean, there is a little bit of performance variation here, but very, very little performance variation here. So we can actually go to a point where we we don't see any performance variation, regardless of how we're doing our I.O. Um, and so, in fact, I will skip to the end here and just say what I think is interesting from this is it lets us do some architect re-architecture of our applications to do our I.O in smaller chunks, in much smaller chunks. Uh, and what I find interesting about that is that probably frees us up to actually re-architect some of our HPC systems. So we don't need so much volatile memory on the nodes. We don't need to keep so much data in volatile memory. And we actually can move data in and out from non-volatile memory on the nodes in small chunks and, and process it in, in those ways, um, provided we have this fast on node memory storage uh, rather than fast on node block storage. Um, okay, so I'll finish there. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions um, offline if, if I've run out of time. Thanks a lot. No, no, we're going to ask you some questions online. Um, actually, I have a couple of them. Um, one is related to the, um, the future of uh, node, uh, node local storage, uh, specifically if it's uh, linked to Optan, where it's still a bit unclear what is a roadmap for Optan. So what is your take on this? So, so my my take on this is that um, the, my, my uh, I think my, the problem with Optane uh, for Intel and Micron has been that it, it's lacking a killer application, right? So it's it's fast, um, it's fast, but it's not enough, it's not faster than, um, significantly faster than you know, expensive NVMe devices for block storage. Uh, and so really it's come down to this niche where you're putting it into the metadata parts of storage applications because every application we have currently is optimized for block IO. It's optimized for writing over the hardware we have currently for devices. And in that context, opt-in looks expensive and unnecessary because if you're gonna still maintain you're going to write over block devices then you might as well just buy an NVMe and stick it on the PCI Express bus or you might as well buy six NVMe's and stick them in the nodes. Where I think Optane really wins is this small I.O uh, and you know this is often characterized as small random I.O but it doesn't have to be random I.O and so I think the potential for Optane uh, or the potential for using non-volatile memory in the nodes, in the memory channels, um, is really that it allows us to re-architect how we do I.O., move away from these um, situations where we're dependent on 
large scale uh, bulk IO um, and still get good performance. Now, of course, the challenge is that no applications work like that because that's not how you would have written your IO in the past 30 years because that wouldn't have given you good performance. But what we're starting to try and demonstrate now is actually if you take your application and re-architecture it, with the assumption this memory will be available in the nodes you're using, then you can actually start to benefit from that um, in, in different ways. And I think it becomes a, a proper architectural question then because it does become, okay, how non volatile memory in my nodes is expensive in terms of energy. Volatile memory in my nodes is expensive in terms of capital cost. If I replace some of that with non-volatile memory, can I change the way I develop my HPC nodes and the way the applications use it and come up with something like the A64FX processor, you know, it has 32 gigabytes of non-volatile memory on the, no, sorry, volatile memory on the processor, but no DRAM. Uh, could you come up, up with HPC uh, processors which have smaller amounts of HBM but a large amount of non-volatile memory on the node, as long as the applications are architected in such a way that they can use a small memory footprint and shuffle data in and out of non-volatile memory in the way it was shown shouldn't have significant impact on their performance. So I, I see it as a, a really interesting architectural trend, but it needs you know, significant application change going forward, and that needs to be demonstrated to be beneficial for people to do it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the detailed answer. And, and you mentioned several times that this is not a, a revolutionary, but I, I still think that uh, uh, in terms of architecture, this is a revolution. It's hard, but, but it's, uh, there is a revolution. It's, it's definitely a revolution, but it's not a new revolution in the sense that people have been talking about it for a while. You know, if, if you look at the papers, people, have, people even in this workshop will have been talking about putting the node local storage in and trying to exploit it. I just think that they... The, the interesting thing is quite often people will say, you know, the thing about non-volatile memory is that we, we've got a large memory space, but the non-volatility of it is um, is a you know happenstance. We don't care about the persistent nature of it. We just care about it being large memory. And, and I, I think we should turn that on its head and say, actually, we care about this being non-volatile, but we care about it being non-volatile and high performance for small amounts of I.O. And are there interesting things we can do with applications which exploit that functionality. And until we do that, then people won't really be putting this in their nodes because it's too expensive to stick in with, with no apparent use case. Anyway, okay. I, I, I'm sure I've used my time up, but thank you. So thanks, thanks a lot. And now uh, 